Hello, I'm Todd Lamarand. Tonight on APTN Investigates, the forced sterilization of Indigenous women is a dark and largely unknown chapter in Canadian history. Today it's considered an act of cultural genocide, but eugenics was the law in some provinces as late as the 1970s. It's estimated that over 1,200 Indigenous women were sterilized throughout the country in that decade alone. This practice should have been a thing of the past, but as Colin Crozier reports, Four women have come forward in the last year. They claim they were pressured into getting sterilized at Saskatoon's Royal University Hospital. While all of their stories are unique, they also bear striking similarities. All of them were in vulnerable positions, indigenous, and all say they were sterilized against their will. Here now are their stories. I came in and I was in labor. I was in full labor. And uh, I was alone. I didn't have any family or friends with me. And uh, it was a very traumatic, scary experience for me. I was crying, obviously. And one of the nurses had approached me and she said, you know, clearly you don't want to be in this kind of position again. And there's this option available of having your tubes tied. They never really said anything in my presence, but I could hear them talking down the hallway or, um, uh, like the, the head nurse would always ask the other nurses, did she sign those papers yet? I, I heard her ask that around three or four times because my, my room is just two doors down from the nurse's station. So I, I heard her ask them several times, like, has she signed the papers yet? Has she signed the papers yet? There's a, sh a sheet in front of me. I'm laid down. I can't move. I'm frozen from the waist down. And I said, I don't want to do this. I clearly heard the doctor say, did she sign the consent form? And one of the nurses, or whoever it was on the other side of the sheet with her, said yes, and that's when I felt her start prodding at me. This is Saskatoon's Royal University Hospital. It's known as a place of healing, but also one of teaching and training, located on the University of Saskatchewan campus. Within the last year, four Indigenous women have come forward claiming they were sterilized against their will right here at the hospital's maternity ward. Brenda Pelche was the first to break her silence, but she wouldn't be the last. It was clear I didn't want to do this. They kept harassing me and harassing me every time they came in my room. Did you sign this? Did you sign this? Did you sign this? If I didn't sign it, obviously I didn't want it done. Like, how hard is that to understand? It's been over six years since Pelche says that she was pressured into getting sterilized at the Royal University Hospital. A recovering addict, she made the decision to change her life for the better when she found out that she was pregnant with her seventh child. I just wanted to do what was best for her. And for that, I, I moved away and went through treatment, all of that. I did it all on my own. I wasn't forced into it, anything like that. I just did it because I wanted to keep my baby. The delivery went as expected and she gave birth to a healthy baby girl. But what started out as a joyous occasion soon turned into a nightmare. I don't even think I slept through the night or else it started early the next day that they kept bugging me and bugging me to sign this paper. The paper that she was being pressured to sign was a consent form to undergo tubal ligation surgery, a virtually irreversible procedure that would prevent her from ever becoming pregnant again. According to Pell Che, this all happened within a matter of hours after having given birth. And then that's when the, the social worker came in and said, well, we want a tubal, we, want, we don't want you to leave the hospital until a tubal's done. And I was like, what's a tubal? We're going to tie your tubes. I was like, no, I didn't want it done. I did not want it done. Pelche says that she was harassed by hospital staff throughout the night. Her continued refusals to sign off on the procedure apparently ignored. It wasn't until the next day, after hours of pressuring, that a tired and exhausted Pelche says she finally gave in. The next morning when they came again, they said the operating room is ready. You need to sign this paper. And I still didn't want to. To this day, I can't remember if I properly signed it or if I was so mad that I was being forced that I may have just scribbled. But it didn't end there. According to Pelche, she continued to refuse the surgery, even on the operating table. It was a terrifying experience, one that she continues to struggle with on a daily basis.
I tried everything to get out of it, and it didn't matter. Like, you know, if, if they didn't have that clip on my baby's button, I would have probably walked out with her, but yeah, I would have sent, sent off alarms, so I had no choice but to wait for them to let me go, and they weren't going to let me go until I signed papers. Malika Pop was a single mother working towards finishing her degree when she first heard about Brenda Pelche's experience at the Royal University Hospital. It's a story that she related to immediately. She also felt pressured into getting sterilized when she delivered her son there in 2008. It was very hasty, very quick, um, very rushed conversation. Mind you, I, I was in full labor, so um, I wasn't fully informed. The birth was premature, and Pop was understandably concerned when she arrived at the hospital. But before she was admitted, she says she was cornered by hospital staff and verbally abused about her pregnancy. The nurse was really harassing me, concerning, asking me what kind of birth control I was on, why I didn't use a condom, that I should consider adoption. Um, those, those questions I felt really uncomfortable with. I felt that they were just judgmental and it just didn't seem like the place because a hospital is supposed to be filled with caring, caring nurses and caring doctors and I didn't get that. Pop was already in full labor when she says a doctor pressured her into signing off on the surgery. She was told that the process was reversible if she changed her mind. They told me that there was no side effects and I remember the doctor emphatically shaking her head. There are no side effects. This can be reversed. Um, if you change your mind, it can be reversed. And, uh, you know, they're doctors. I trusted them. Pop says that she was brought to the delivery room only after she signed the papers, consenting to the tubal ligation. What happened next would have a devastating impact on the new mother for years to come. I couldn't move because they were following right after my son. They were sterilizing me. They were tying my tubes or cutting them and cauterizing them. It wasn't until Pop was moved back to the recovery room that she first began to understand what had happened to her. The birth of her son would be forever shadowed by what she considers an act of cultural genocide. It crippled me as a woman, you know, reproductively. And um, it took away a huge part of my identity as a woman. Yeah, it forever changed me. For Roxanne Ledoux, the decision to come forward with her story was something that she felt compelled to do. Ledoux is HIV positive and believes that played a large role in the hospital's insistence that she have her tubes tied. I knew it wasn't right, you know, yeah. And I knew that I had to um, tell somebody or I had, you know, I had to give myself a voice. Because of her health issues, Ledoux was already apprehensive when she checked into the Royal University Hospital in the spring of 2006 to deliver her son. She was lying in her hospital bed, nervous about the impending delivery, when she says several nurses first approached her about the procedure. They kept coming into the room with these papers for me to sign, like they wanted me to sign the papers for to tie my tubes and I told them that I wasn't prepared to make that decision yet because I was really <clears throat> uh, preoccupied with um, having my child, you know, and that I, I wasn't ready to make that kind of decision. But every time there was a shift change, it seemed like a new nurse would come in with the papers and, and um, ask me again. To this day, Ledoux is convinced that she didn't knowingly sign off on the procedure. When she was brought to the operating room, she believed that it was only to deliver her baby. It wasn't until she smelled something burning that she realized what was happening to her. I can't even explain what it smelled like. It was, was, was awful. I could smell something burning. And I asked uh, whoever was standing there, and I asked kind of whoever was in the room, what is that? What's that smell? And the... The doctor looked at the nurse, who, and the nurse told me that it was, they were tying my tubes because I had signed the papers, and, and I was like, oh, no, I didn't sign those papers. Ledoux remained silent for many years after. It wasn't until Brenda Pelche 
and Malika Pop came forward with their experiences that she finally found the will to speak out. I just wanted to give, to tell my story so somebody else will, you know, if this is happening, has happened to somebody else, that they'll, they'll have, you know, the strength to come forward and say something because it's not right. But finding the strength to come forward is often easier said than done. For Brenda Pelche, Malika Pop, and Roxanne Ledoux, the decision to speak out took an enormous amount of courage, but also a huge toll. What exactly happened to these women at the Royal University Hospital has now become a point of contention. Were these merely isolated cases or part of a larger systemic problem? After the break, as Malika Pop Brenda Pelche and Roxanne Ledoux search for answers. We speak with the Saskatoon Health Region about the shocking allegations. Before the break, we heard the stories of three women who claimed they were sterilized against their will at a Saskatoon hospital. Were these isolated cases or part of a larger systemic problem? Here again is Colin Crozier with part two of Against Their Will. There's no way to walk into a situation like that completely prepared. Mm -hmm. And uh, I certainly wasn't prepared to have the rest of my life change, my body change, my hormones change, um, my identity as a woman um, taken from me. I just couldn't believe like how callous the health professionals are and how calculated they are, you know, it was, it was like, um, they obviously thought about it, you know, before they done it. I think it was just because it was, I was native, I was a recovering addict, it was my seventh kid, um, I was low income, um, anything that they could use against me was used against me. It's been a long road to recovery for Malika Pop, Roxanne Ledoux, and Brenda Pelche. All three women have dealt with the trauma of being sterilized against their will in their own way. I trust nobody, absolutely nobody. If I can't trust a doctor or, you know, people in these kind of positions, I can't trust anybody. I just, it's put me in a shell. Like, I don't, I don't want to make new friends. I don't want to meet new people. I don't even want to leave my house. Pelche has filed numerous complaints with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Saskatchewan about her sterilization at the Royal University Hospital. The doctors who performed the procedure have responded to her accusations, but according to Pelche, no one has been held accountable. As far as I'm concerned, the doctors are all teaming up against me saying, oh, she's wrong, she's wrong. But how come I remember this? How come I remember the doctor telling me they're catarizing you? For Malika Pop, the full impact of her sterilization didn't hit home until years later. I was in a relationship and I was contemplating marriage. I wanted to have kids again and I went to go to have this reversed. And when I learned of the slim chances, when I learned of the scar tissue and I learned of the damage, I was devastated, devastated as a woman. Like all of the women who have come forward, Pop feels that she was unjustly singled out because she was Indigenous. She sees her sterilization as a violation of her human rights, one that not only robbed her of the ability to have children, but also denied her the chance to pass on her Indigenous rights and title to future generations. I'm enraged that this kind of thing, systemic racism, racially profiling is allowed to continue. Especially, I mean, when a woman is most vulnerable, most exposed, you know, and, and is in need of um, protection. While it's hard to imagine these types of abuses taking place in today's healthcare system, 
The coercive sterilization of Indigenous women has a long and dark chapter in Canadian history. Eugenics was the law in some provinces up until the 1970s. And while the exact numbers may never be known, what is for certain is that Indigenous women were disproportionately targeted. Imposing measures to prevent births within a group when it's done to undermine the ability of that group to continue to exist is an act of genocide under international law and now since um, the early 2000s un under Canadian law. Dr. Karen Stoke is an assistant professor of women and gender studies at Wilfrid Laurier University. Her book, An Act of Genocide, deals specifically with the coercive sterilization of Indigenous women in Canada. Under these conditions of colonialism that we live under, you can't understand them only as individual acts, right? They're, they're happening within a historical context and they're happening within a present context, right? What are the relations between Canada and Indigenous people today? Stoat wasn't surprised when she first heard about the accusations of coercive sterilization in Saskatoon. She sees the recent cases as an extension of past colonial policies in Canada's healthcare system. These are part of a long-standing history that's happened and when you're aware of the history you understand that there continues to be a racism uh, that exists um, and that shapes uh, Indigenous interactions with Canadian, Canadian people, Canadian institutions and the Canadian government itself, right? And so it's not necessarily surprising to me. Um, it's troublesome um, but it's not necessarily surprising. It brings up an important question. Were these merely isolated cases or part of a larger systemic problem? I think the, the people who were sterilized, perhaps as a result of coercive pressure, plus the wider community, plus First Nations people, are entitled to know whether this involved systemic racism, whether it was uh, a problem of uh, poor performance by doctors and nurses at the hospital, or whether there was some other problem. Professor Arthur Schaefer is the director of the Center for Professional and Applied Ethics at the University of Manitoba. He says it's acceptable, and in some cases even encouraged, to discuss sterilization with women under certain circumstances. If the woman's health status puts her at high risk, if another pregnancy would mean likely death uh, for a woman, then it's the obligation of her physician in a calm and informed way to discuss with her all the options including sterilization. But according to the women that we spoke with, that's not what happened at the Royal University Hospital. It's not the fact that it's being discussed with the women uh, that's the problem. Uh, it should be discussed, but it shouldn't be discussed in such a fraught situation as the process of giving birth or having just given birth or having just undergone surgery and it should never be coercive. People are entitled to make this choice for themselves. So what exactly happened at the Royal University Hospital? Were these women pressured and coerced into getting sterilized? Or was it a failure of the system as a whole? To help answer some of these questions, we've gone straight to the source. We don't think we did the best we could for these women and that they weren't treated the way that I would want any woman to be treated in our service and for that we apologize and, and we didn't do what we should have done. Leanne Smith is the Director of Maternal Services for the Saskatoon Health Region. Her department was responsible for the treatment the women received at the Royal University Hospital. I do believe that these women in the stories that I've heard they felt pressured and that's something that we're very sorry for and something that should not happen to anyone about any procedure. You know, I believe very strongly in informed and free consent and from the stories we heard that wasn't the circumstance that these ladies experienced and that's not okay. So, you know, we need to do better. Following the allegations, the Saskatoon Health Region has made a number of changes to their policy regarding tubal ligation. The new policy has over 30 changes and amendments. Tubal ligations must now be accompanied by full, free and informed consent, an addition that was glaringly omitted from the old policy. And the discussion to have the procedure must now occur prior to a patient being admitted to hospital. Women now also have the right to withdraw consent up to and including in the operating room. 
the hospital implicitly is saying we didn't have proper safeguards in place prior to the problems with which these women were faced. Now we're talking about a period of years. We're talking about not just one case but many, possibly many more than we know of at the moment. And so I think we still want to hear from the hospital uh, what went wrong. It's a good question and the health region is planning on launching an external review into the allegations. Jackie Mann is the health region's vice president of integrated health services. Entering this external review, honestly it's not about blame, it's about how can we improve and how can we as a system ensure that the processes that we have in place are the right processes for our patients, our families and for our staff so that they know um, how to work in those situations. That's not the answer that Malika Pop, Roxanne Ledoux and Brenda Pelche were hoping for. While all three women are cautiously optimistic about the health region's changes in policy, they'd still like to see someone held accountable for what was done to them. I think that very big question needs to be addressed, needs to be answered. And whoever is accountable, whether it be the Saskatoon Health Region or the individual doctors at large, I think it has to be addressed. It's an action the health region appears unwilling to take, but one that each of the women who came forward considers essential to ensure the reproductive liberties of future mothers will be protected and never taken from them against their will. For the other women, I just didn't want them to have to go through it and it's not fair to, you know, have somebody else tell you, okay, well, this is what we're going to do to you, even if you don't want it done. And I didn't want that to happen to other women. What's done is done. I can't change it. It's not reversible. Um, but I'd like an apology and I'd like an explanation. Knowing that there is hope of, of uh, healing, there, there is hope of change, and that life again is possible. The number of tubal ligations performed throughout Saskatchewan have decreased in the last six years. Saskatoon Health Region couldn't say for certain how many women have had similar experiences at the Royal University Hospital. It has apologized to all of the women who have come forward so far, but it is yet to hold any hospital staff personally accountable. An external review into allegations of forced sterilization is set to begin soon and will wrap up in April. Women who feel that they may have been pressured into undergoing tubal ligation surgery should contact the Health Region's Department of First Nations and Métis Health Service. Next week, Kathleen Martins has Article 23. It states jobs in Nunavut must go to Inuit, but that's not happening. One man is trying to change that. I'm Todd Lamarand. Have a great evening. <laughs>